Hi, I'm Dr. Brian Reem, a professor of medicine at uh, Vanderbilt University Medical Center in Nashville. And today I'm going to share my interpretation of key data that was presented at the 2023 ASCO GU Oncology Cancer Symposium, talking about the latest immune-based combination therapy for the treatment of advanced uh, renal cell carcinoma. We'll touch a little bit on biomarkers to predict response and go over evidence of how these immune-based combinations can be integrated into daily practice. The agenda for today uh, is broken down to three categories. The first is around these uh, immune checkpoint inhibitor ICI-based combinations and what the latest efficacy data show. The second is around the potential role of biomarkers in predicting response to these immune-based combinations, again, in advanced kidney cancer. And then the third is really implementation um, for these immune-based combinations and, and any biomarkers uh, into clinical practice. So the first section that we'll cover is uh, ICI or immune checkpoint inhibitor based combinations in the treatment of advanced or metastatic RCC. What did the latest data uh, show regarding efficacy and safety? So just to back up, this is a, a very broad summary slide over the last, gosh, almost 20 years of drug development in kidney cancer. And you can see in the left box there, you see the, the single agent targeted inhibitors of either VEGF signaling several different options, mostly TKIs, and then a couple mTOR inhibitors. And these were developed and implemented in the early 2000s and were really good at controlling disease but not curing it. And up until about, I guess, maybe eight to 10 years ago, where the standard of care is sort of a sequence of sequential monotherapy of targeted therapy. And then with first the introduction of nivolumab, a PD-1 checkpoint inhibitor in the refractory setting, sort of launched the immune oncology era in kidney cancer. And as you can see, that single agent data and indication was quickly followed by several different combinations uh, of either two immune drugs for the ipinevo combination or an immune drug plus a VEGF targeted drug for many of the other regimens that you see there. And really today we'll be talking about the right hand side of this screen and all the immune based combinations, which have been approved and actually in use for quite some time, but we're starting to get longer term data, updated data, and then now some biomarker data. So here's a broad swath of some large ongoing phase three trials in kidney cancer. Not all have data that's available. The first is COSMIC 313. We will talk about this study today. This was first presented at ESMO last year and updated at this year's ASCO GU. This was the first triplet study in advanced RCC, which was ipinevo placebo versus ipinevo cabozantinib, attempting to sort of get the best of both worlds in terms of active drugs and active regimens. And we'll talk more about those data. The next two are trials that have not yet reported out. Uh, one, the next line is called 8Y8. This was a trial that the European regulators required when ipinevo was first presented, and it really gets to the value of the addition of ipilimumab. So it's uh, ipinevo versus nevo in frontline advanced kidney cancer. It's a smaller trial uh, that's been ongoing and will really tease out the role of ipi in this disease. The next is called Pedigree, and it's sort of an adaptive trial, a large U.S. cooperative group trial that attempts to add in cabozantinib, but not in, at the start for all patients like COSMIC 313 did, but only in patients who uh, fail to achieve a complete response. Um, and that's an interesting trial that's accruing probably some time before that's reported. And then the final is CONTACT-03, which we'll talk about at the very end of this segment, which was just reported, but only in press release. We don't have all the data, but was atezolizumab plus cabozantinib versus cabozantinib in immune refractory patients. So asking the question of, can patients get another shot at immune therapy? What's the role of immune therapy in patients who've already been on immune therapy? And we know from the press release, the progression-free survival did not show an advantage. That's about all we know, but I'll, um, we'll be talking about that more at the end of this segment. So the first data that we'll touch on was an update of the Checkmate 90R trial uh, presented by Dr. Barado. This um, was cabozantinib versus nivolumab. Uh, cabozantinib plus nivolumab, excuse me, versus sunetinib in patients with advanced kidney cancer. This was a, a minimum three-year follow-up. This was equal randomization. The cabozantinib dosed at 40 in this regimen, which has been standard in combination dosing, looking at progression-free survival primarily, but also overall survival. And what's important about these data is that for the IOTKI regimens, we're just starting to get this three, four, five-year data. Um, Ipinevo preceded these studies by two or three years. We have more mature data for that combination. So it's important now that we get long, longer term follow up for the IOTKI combos. And what was seen um, 
is a progression-free survival advantage that persisted really from the first report, about 16 and a half versus eight and a half months. Um, um, immediate OS advantage that persisted with a similar hazard ratio. Objective response rate, 56%. Complete response rate, 12%. So numbers that weren't really radically different than the initial report. Um, but again, with longer follow-up, it's good to see persistence of this efficacy signal. And I, I don't no real new safety signals or a typical toxicity you expect from this combination and from sunitinib in general, uh, but nothing longer term that emerged with safety. Another important data set presented was this COSMIC 313, which I talked briefly about the Ipinevo versus Ipinevo Cabo. This was an update in patients with intermediate or poor risk. Um, I've described the trial already. The progression-free survival did show an advantage to the triplet, but there was not an overall survival advantage reported. Um, and so these data were really just updating that uh, PFS that was, again, first reported at ESMO. So the efficacy that was seen in, in if you break this down into intermediate risk, was just, which is where most of the benefit was seen, almost 18 months versus 11 months, hazard ratio 0.68. We don't see that difference in the poor risk patients. And we'll talk about why that might be the case, hazard ratio of, of 0.93. So no advantage in that poor risk patients, albeit a subset. And we res see response rates pretty consistent across the board of about 40% plus or minus with low complete response rates. And remember, this is a very early uh, look at these data. So I have a feeling those data will evolve and mature over time. And the last study we'll talk about in this segment is this Cabo point that Laurence Albiges presented from France. And this was a study of two different cohorts using Cabo Zantinib at 60 milligrams a day in patients who had failed immune-based therapy. Um, either Ipinevo or IOTKI. And I would say this really reflects how this drug is being used in clinical practice. I think many of us use this drug as second line after our first line combination, assuming that combination didn't uh, contain cabozantinib. And they were really just looking at response rate. So sort of the early signal. Uh, 82 patients overall, um, about uh, two thirds um, uh, in what's called, what was called cohort A and, and 25 in cohort B. You see the response rates pretty similar across the board, approximately. 30%, which is about what I would have expected for cabozantinib in this setting, mostly PRs, as we see with single agent TKI. I think the value of these data, honestly, is we start to design trials in this setting where cabozantinib is often the control. It gives us a good null hypothesis, if you will, about what we can expect because previous data had largely been retrospective. So that concludes the brief update of some of the latest clinical trial data presented at ASCOGU 2023. I'm now going to introduce uh, my panel for the discussion segment of this. So first is Professor, Professor Betsy Plimack, who is Professor of Medical Oncology and the Deputy Director at Fox Chase Cancer Center in the United States, and Professor Tom Powells, who's at the Barts Cancer Center and, uh, Institute and Director of the Barts Cancer Center and St. Barts Hospital in the UK. So welcome to both of you. Um, we're going to, um, over the ne maybe next five or seven minutes, I'd love to hear your opinion about some of that data. And why don't we start with Checkmate 9 ER. Betsy, I'll start with you. What did you take away from that update? How important is it? Did it change your opinion about the data uh, or not? Yeah, so I think consistency is what we're seeing across these updates. I'm glad they're presented. I think, you know, we talk a lot about the short term benefits, CR, PR, PFS, but we really want to see those long term benefits now that we're in a modern era of immunotherapy, um, which I would say the Ibinevo trial wasn't quite conducted in, right? It was a little bit before before that. So I'm really looking though for landmarks. I think we're focused on hazard ratios compared to sunitinib. I think, you know, sunitinib, we just, it's, it's an outdated control arm. It's what we used. Um, it's consistent across the trials, um, but I'm more interested in how combinations do relative to one another in cross trial comparison than sort of relative to sunitinib. So that's just a broad overview of how, you know, these data are important in the context of all the TKI, IO and, and ipinevo um, combos that we talk about. Um, but I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised that the results are durable. I'm not surprised that the benefit is maintained. Um, I think this is what we expected to see, but it's nice to see it. And I hope we keep seeing these every year for these trials. Yeah, fair enough. Tom, anything to add to what Betsy said about 9ER? Uh, no, I agree with Betsy. I, I guess the one area of concern that I have is the, the data does seem to be changing in the good risk group. Uh, we felt very strongly initially that VEGF, TKI, IO combinations were clearly out forming sunitinib 
and that Ipi Nevo was inferior to sunitinib. Um, and now with these latest data cuts, the hazard ratios are all coming in around one for all of the combinations versus sunitinib. And uh, I accept that the response rates are higher and the PFS is longer, but it's likely that some of these patients are being rescued from survival benefit uh, around second line therapy. And so I think my opinion in that good risk, change, good risk group is changing a bit. And, and I think that the biology suggests that good risk group does seem to be quite responsive to VEGF targeted therapy. Yeah, I, mean, I agree with you. I think we know that, you know, from some of the biologic studies. Let's move to the second data set around Cosmic 313. Tom, we'll start with you since you presented these data. We saw a PFS benefit in the whole court. It appears to be driven exclusively by that intermediate risk group. The poor risk group don't doesn't differentiate and, and they don't do well. Again, well, that's why they're poor risk. What how important is this analysis? Like what, what does it tell us about poor risk patients, yeah. if anything? So we haven't seen survival data yet for the trial. That's really important. Um, and, uh, and this data is more mature. It's actually a larger data set. It's 850 patients. It's five more right. months of follow-up. Um, so it's reassuring and that PFS's signal is still there. Um, but I don't think it's practice changing yet, in my opinion. Um, the data suggested that the benefit was mainly confined to the intermediate risk group, although this was quite exploratory. It wasn't mm -hmm. statistically designed to look at this. And the numbers are still quite modest, actually. So I think there may be some statistical noise in, in, in that. Nevertheless, um, the, ben the benefit in the intermediate risk group um, held up in this um, larger subset of patients that, was it, uh, that it was explored in. And, and so we went on to look to see if the poorest patients were just unable to get the triplet. You know, triplet therapy is quite challenging. And there was a feeling that perhaps it was the case that we couldn't get the, the cavazatinib in or that there were early, lots of early discontinuations and the patients were falling apart. Wasn't the case, actually. Similar exposure in both groups. And so if it's not statistical noise, which it might not be, and it is truly a finding, then I guess it points to the biology again. And the biology might be that in those poorest group of patients, you know, they're mainly driven by this sort of immune infiltration and uh, an immune therapy PD-1 based therapy is really important in that group. And then the other extreme we said earlier in the good risk patients, mainly driven by VEGF targeted therapy, where VEGF, VEGF TKIs are really important. So it does kind of fit with the biology, but as I said before, exploratory analysis. Yeah, thanks. But see, anything to add, any high level yeah, thoughts I mean, about cosmetics? Brian, actually, I'd be interested in your thoughts as well. I'll just, I think everything Tom, you said is certainly plausible. I, I was very surprised by these data. I think we thought before ESMO that we would see the best benefit of triplet in the poorest risk patients. Um, and not only do we not see that, but we're seeing that really it's intermediate risk that's kind of carrying the results here. So I can't say I have a good answer, but I do think we should be very curious about why, um, you know, 0.68 hazard ratio versus 0.93 is, is different. Um, are we doing something different? Is there something specific to triplet in the biology of poor risk disease? Is it that we have, you know, sort of one chance um, and even though the exposures were the same, maybe we're doing some detriment with layering all of those therapies on someone who's already poor risk, perhaps um, a cohort of those people are poor risk due to poor performance status. So all of this is my speculation, um, but I think it's interesting and we should pay attention to this going forward. But Brian, yeah, what do you think? I think, I mean, I think the exposure was the same, but it wasn't really great in any of the triplet groups, right? That was part of the, the lesson for the whole trial, in my opinion. And I think you know, poor risk is poor risk is just not angiogenic driven or very less, much less angiogenic driven as you accumulate risk factors. And so adding a VEGF inhibitor probably isn't going to help those folks. In fact, they probably need totally different therapy that we haven't invented yet, so to speak. So I don't know that it's terribly important. I'm not sure what's going to happen with this triplet. Again, we haven't seen survival, but there are other triplets that are uh, being investigated. And so we'll see if, if this story plays out with those other triplets. Coming back to Betsy's point, you know, yeah. we all felt it was going to be the poorest that we're going to rescue. And those patients that we know that progress on Ipinevo, they, in my experience, they tend to be those poorest patients. And I thought we were rescuing them with Len Pen, Cabo Nevo, Axi Pembro. So it has created a real conundrum in my mind. Let's move on in the interest of time to Cabo Point. This is a fairly simple data set, right? We see a response rate of roughly 30% in IO combination refractory. Betsy, maybe start with you. 
What do you think the take home is? So I love this study. I think it reflects how we practice today, right? We give doublet and then we try to figure out what to give next. So this provides actual data where we can quote a response rate to our patients of about 30% with CABO um, post-frontline ICI-based combination therapy. So it is very simple. It's very straightforward, but it answers a clinical question, and I was happy to see it presented. We didn't see PFS yet, so that'll be important. And then very quickly, I'm going to give you each one minute to summarize what you think about the Contact 03 press release. CABO Atezo versus CABO and IO Refractory, no PFS advantage. That's all we know. Tom, you can start. 60 seconds. Well, I think the first thing is that when we started with this immune therapy journey with PD, PDL1 therapy, we were told by the biologists, the basic scientists, that the drugs have a long term side effect, long term effect. And those effects go well beyond the time of stopping the drugs. And that's indeed why we stopped pembrolizumab and other drugs. And so the principle of, 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 of switching to a different VEGF T. Well, you might say the, the, the immune therapy is still there. Mm-hmm. And so, because um, all of these patients in contact three previously were exposed to immune therapy. So, you know, I, I, I'm anxious um, about that issue. I also think it's fair to say that at the moment, there doesn't seem to be any role for sequencing PD, PDL1 therapy in this disease. Um, and that probably almost applies to the adjuvant setting as well, which is important because we're using adjuvant pembrolizumab. Um, I'd like to see data when patients have had a genuine long break off therapy to see if reintroduction a year or two years later makes a difference. Sure. And there's a little bit of bladder cancer data out there in with pembrolizumab for patients who, who stopped after two years who had responded and then were challenged years later and they re-responded. So there may be that some patients are hardwired to re-respond. Betsy, any, any comments? Nothing to add to that, really. I just feel like atezolizumab hasn't quite hit the mark in a number of trials and you wonder about just the drug itself. Fair. Well, thank you both. This was a great discussion on some of the recent data from ASCO GU uh, 2023. And thanks to our audience for listening. We're going to talk now about the potential role of biomarkers in predicting response to immune-based combination in patients with uh, advanced kidney cancer. So biomarkers is a big topic in kidney cancer. We've been looking for useful biomarkers, certainly for the 20 plus years that I've been involved in kidney cancer research. This slide summarizes a little bit of, of where we are, the state of the art, so to speak. So pdl one expression has, has not been reliable in kidney cancer. We know it's associated with higher tumor stage and prognosis in general. I think it enriches for response to ipinevo, doesn't appear to be associated with IOTKI, and it's not something that we use in clinical practice. Uh, Genomic signatures, there's been a lot of work around this, um, uh, usually RNA-seq based. And there have been a lot of large data sets, some from the phase three that have shown some preliminary association with outcomes that are being studied further. I think personally that they're quite promising. Circulating biomarkers are appealing, of course, because you don't need tumor tissue and you just need access to the patient's blood. So this would be circulating tumor cells or CTCs. We'll talk about an abstract. Circulating tumor DNA, which is making a lot of headway in other diseases, not quite as much in kidney cancer yet. And then other circulating uh, RNA proteins, et cetera. Um, uh, Tumor mutational burden or TMB has shown association with immune response in other tumors. But kidney cancer tends to have a low TMB, and so we're not really using that, and it doesn't appear to be associated with our current immune regimens. And then a clinical biomarker of immune-mediated or immune-related adverse events, and I think this is true across many tumors, um, kidney cancer included, especially with regimens like ipinevo that are solely immune-based. I think we do see an association, but how exactly to use that in clinical practice, I don't know that we've perfected, but I think there's clearly an association. So let's dive into the first abstract. This is a biomarker analysis from the Checkmate 9ER study, which was nivolumab, cabozantinib versus sunitinib. A lot of the phase threes that have reported clinical results are now starting to report their biomarker results. Uh, And most of these studies had pretreatment tumor samples, probably largely nephrectomies, and they, they were not necessarily immediately before treatment. They could have been in the distant past. This study had 640 such tissue samples did RNA sequencing in about two thirds of them and did immunohistochemistry in the majority of them, looking at um, what's called gene set enrichment analysis and looking at uh, gene pathways and then individual gene expression. 
And then also looking at some of the other gene expression signatures that have been reported from separate um, phase three trials. And the immunohistochemistry looked at um, some of the, the common things we look at, pdl one which I mentioned, CD8, a marker of activated T cells, and looking at some of the, not only the phenotype of those activated T cells and location, and then CMET, cabozanib is felt to be a CMET inhibitor. So you can imagine that that could have influenced uh, outcome here. This was a very, um, a very data dense uh, abstract. And again, when you look at enough things, you're going to find, you know, some that are positive and some that are negative. So I view a lot of these analyses as, as preliminary and hypothesis generating. Um, there were some that were associated with progression-free survival. So the gene set enrichment analyses, now those were also prognostic, right? So they were true in both arms. So that association probably has more to do with the underlying biology of disease than a treatment effect. Um, some of the CD8 parameters were associated with PFS, but not prognostic. So perhaps a little more um, predictive of response and, and T cell parameters have been shown to be predictive of immune response, not only in kidney cancer, but in other diseases, namely melanoma. And then cytoplasmic CMET, which I think we've struggled to understand the role of CMET in kidney cancer and how does it affect cabozanib response, but it was, was associated with PFS, but, um, but, and, and also prognostic. So a kind of a mixed bag of, of what was associated. They did not find some of the gene expression signatures as consistently associated with outcome in this trial as in other trials, but again, generating some important hypotheses. And it's very important to do this kind of work in a phase three trial. Uh, the second abstract was a small, only 12 patients, but it was interesting because it looked at circulating tumor cells. So they had a small um, population of advanced kidney cancer starting frontline therapy. They got baseline blood and then also looked one and two months into treatment. They had a filtration method based on size to collect and isolate uh, circulating tumor cells and then looked at not only CTC count, but some of the kinetics and also the protein expression within uh, those circulating tumor cells. So I think perhaps the most important finding is that detectable CTCs were present in all patient patients. The methodology um, of CTC detection in kidney cancer has been varied. There's not been a ton of work. It's, it's often not fe been felt to be a high shedding disease where you can easily detect circulating tumor cells. But you know, within the limitations of small sample size, they did detect CTCs in all patients. And then they looked at some parameters about patients who did worse with higher counts and certain protein expression. I think those data are less important given it's a very small data set, but certainly showed feasibility and some promise in association with response. And then the last uh, abstract in this biomarker section um, was a study that looked at 60 patients getting nivolumab or uh, 22 patients getting cabozantinib and doing what they called an immune liquid biopsy, which was a peripheral blood collection at baseline, and then week two and four, and looked at some of the, the phenotypic and transcriptional profiles of certain immune cell subsets, lymphoid and myeloid subsets, and some other parameters. So circulating parameters associated with response to either immune therapy or, or targeted therapy. And again, I think what this relatively small study shows is that um, you know, it may be possible to look at the immune environment from a peripheral blood standpoint. And again, I think that's a key aspect of biomarker development is do we need tumor tissue? Do we need fresh tumor tissue? Or can we look at the circulation, which is a whole lot easier, but a whole lot more complex because there's just more things going on and isolating effect on tumor and effect on other things is difficult. But they did show some changes in uh, myelodrive suppressor cells and T cells that were associated with response as well as cytokine uh, changes, which have been shown by others as well, as well as some interesting miRNA findings. So again, I view this as a, a, a promise, a hypothesis generating in terms of can this technology uh, help us develop biomarkers for this disease. That was the, the overview of some of the latest emerging biomarker data in kidney cancer from ASCO GU 2023. I'll now introduce uh, my panel of discussants, uh, Professor Betsy Plimack, who is a professor of medical oncology and deputy director of Fox Chase Cancer Center in the United States. And Thomas Powell, who's a professor of GU Oncology at Bart's Cancer Institute and director of Bart's Cancer Center at St. Bart's Hospital in the UK. So welcome to both of you. We're going to um, go over these abstracts briefly. Let's start with 9ER. So this was another report of one of these big phase threes that sort of said, we're going to get all the tissue we can and look at everything that we know how to look at and report on it. 
Um, and, and again, the, all the investigators should be commended because that's a big, expensive effort to do that. Tom, I'll start with you. You're your biomarker kind of guy. Like, did did anything speak to you in in this biomarker effort, either in terms of clinical utility or just that that um, or lack of clinical utility in the results? I thought there were two parts that were really relevant. First is that the immunohistochemistry for MET, and uh, we've been talking a lot about MET expression and CABO for a while, uh, and and that didn't really pan out via immunohistochemistry. Now, you, uh, it's not a perfect test, I suspect, but I think that's relevant because I think most of the acti- activity of CABO is via its VEGF activity. Um, the other piece, which I think is relevant, is it is the first time we've seen data presented on a PD-1 combination with VEGF-TKI. We've seen quite a lot of a TESO-BEV data and that program I think is 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 fantastic, and we've also seen a Nature Medicine publication for Evalimab, Axi, but this is the first time we've seen Pembro or Nevo, and I think that PD1 and PDL1 will have distinct biomarker profiles. So I think that the, the attempt to reproduce the results we saw with PDL1, the fact that they're different, shouldn't be a big surprise to us. And I think there's a lot more work to do here. I think we should be doing perhaps more unsupervised analysis, looking at individual genes. Um, I think that some of these gene signatures um, will be relevant, but I'm not surprised that we haven't reproduced the results for PD-L1 inhibition. So you think it's mostly a potentially a PD-1 versus PD-L1 issue? I think there's a lot to there's a lot to mine here, and there's a lot of work to do, and it should be unsupervised initially. Fair enough. Betsy, anything to add? What do you think of this analysis? No, I mean, I agree with Tom's comments, I think. And I'll agree with you. You said thank you to the scientists who did this work because we can really only define biomarkers in the context, I think, of large randomized trials. You know, this is 640 patients. It was expensive. It was a lot of work. And I think the the aspects of the tumor that they looked at are the ones that are relevant. I would just add, I think, you know, maybe it's not just a biomarker t- is predictive on its own. Maybe there are certain groupings of these findings that might together leverage predictability. Um, and I'd like to see the biomarker work. I, I know Tom was suggesting we go to unsupervised clustering, looking even deeper to specific genes. I'm thinking maybe we want to be combining some of these signatures together to see if we get a predictive outcome that way. But the slide that you showed, none were predictive in and of themselves. And so I think it just shows we have more work to do. Yeah. And I think. You know, I guess the good news in all this, we were all around with VEGF-TKI development. The biomarker efforts around VEGF-TKI development were poor, shall we say. They were, they were weak <laughs> and we were all part of them, but they were pretty weak. These are much better efforts, much more sophisticated, more patients, more follow you know. So I think we're getting there. Um, I think given our drugs affect, you know, the tumor stroma as opposed perhaps to the tumor itself, I think it makes it more challenging, but I, I think the effort is there. Let's move to the CTC, the small um, study that looked around CTCs. Betsy, I'll start with you. CTCs have been around for a while. Um, We've looked at them in kidney cancer. Not all tumors yield CTCs, so I'm interested in this is N of 12. Were these patients selected? I guess all all of them did yield CTCs here. Uh, And I think there's not much to say with, with an N of 12, except that this is yet another space and another tissue type, so to speak. Um, that maybe we could look at and analyze. I think you can do single cell um, analysis on the cells once they're retrieved as well. This abstract really looked at CTC counts. So I think maybe this is just the nucleus for a larger study. Um, And then if we see anything, we could then plunk it into one of these phase three um, analyses if we're collecting the tissue appropriately. Thank you. And Tom, you've done a lot of CT DNA work, which is different than CTCs, but do you... What do you think of this work? Do you think it's promising? Would you say, well, it's really difficult to isolate them generally. Let's focus on ctDNA. I mean, yeah. So the group from Wisconsin has, has looked at CTCs as well in a bigger series. They've looked at 120 patients. I know it's not huge. And they've also looked at sequential CTC expression, I think using a slightly different methodology. And But the there is a sensitivity and specificity issue around CTCs, which is why it hasn't... Um, uh, taken off in perhaps the way it might have done. Betsy's right, they've been around for a long, long time. Uh, circulating tumor DNA is different. Um, and 
um, the data outside of kidney cancer looks very promising. There was actually some data at GUASCO as well, looking at a personalized CTDNA approach where 70% of patients who were metastatic uh, could have their identified, uh, per, using a personalized approach, could one could uh, look and track their CTDNA with time. So I think my personal opinion is that this is an area which is expanding very quickly. Um, people are now looking at much deeper sequencing. And I think as we go deeper, we will be able to identify more and more patients who are CTDNA positive. So um, I think circling biomarkers are really important. I think it's great that we're exploring different methodologies. I think that CTCs may not be the methodology we end up with. And just maybe a follow-up question. I, I don't personally use either CTCs or CTDNA, which has you know commercial tests available for clinical decision making. I'm not comfortable doing that. But I do see that, you know, from patients referred to me. And so I'm wondering if if you both agree to me that it we're still a ways from you know, incorporating CTDNA or other circulating markers into routine clinical decision making. Betsy, do you want to take that one to start? Absolutely. I mean, especially in the metastatic setting, you're treating to the scan. Um, measuring these along the way only worries you if they're going the direction you think they shouldn't be going, <laughs> but it doesn't really give you so anything to work with. So I agree with you, Brian. I don't order either yeah. of those. So many, anything to add? Yeah. No, I agree with Betsy. I think she's right. Trying. So, so last um, was around another circulating or other circulating markers. These were more, I would say, more traditional. So, um, do we think do we think circulating immune cells is it going to be that easy just to measure circulating immune cells and cytokines? Um, you know, the data is interesting, but again, relatively small and exploratory. Uh, Tom, maybe start with you. Do you do you hold much promise in terms of just what I would call a very general immune microenvironment, a circulating immune microenvironment for their predictive power. Yeah. So the neutrophil lymphocyte ratio, which is something we've been talking about for some time, that is actually a representation of MDSCs. Um, and um, it's a, obviously it's a very cheap and a dirty way of doing it, but that's what um, NLR is. Um, for, um, uh, that's what we feel it's measuring, and that's why it's prognostically relevant you know, you'll be aware that we've looked at myeloid signatures. You did the work in tumor, Dave McDermott led that work, at looking at in within tumors, showing that myeloid signatures, particularly B cell signatures, we think are uh, a really important uh, in the tumor microenvironment. So the MDSCs have a really important role to play there, and the link between MDSCs and um, and chemokines and cytokines is well established. There's actually some beautiful work going on in prostate cancer in in this in this field. So. And I think um, mechanisms of immune um, mechanisms of response to immune therapy are underexplored, and I think potentially targeting and using this as an area for drug development and biomarkers in the future is really important. And so I think it's an important step, actually. Yeah. Thanks, Tom. Betsy, anything to add? Yeah, no, I, I mean, I agree with everything Tom said. I think this particular abstract, uh, again, a few more patients than the last one we talked about, but it's looking at changes over time for patients on therapy. And I think that's interesting. It's really not biomarker development. That's something you need to know before you start treatment to then select treatment, sure. ideally. Um, but maybe this gives us more information about what the treatment is doing to the tumor and the circulating markers. I'm not sure it's new. We've, we've measured these things before. Um, and so responses you know, are, are somewhat, somewhat typical, but maybe not exactly mm -hmm. predictable. So. Uh, interesting, I think, more discovery than than biomarker work here. I agree. I agree with you both. I would just say, I think targeting myeloid cells, targeting macrophages, I think is going to be one of the next main advances in kidney cancer. If we can get the drugs, I think it's such an important compartment that we're not really targeting now. And I think, um, you know, I'm, maybe it's more hoping than thinking, but I, I'm, I'm hopeful that begin as we start to get drugs that can target macrophages in the myeloid compartment in general, that we'll be able to, to you know, potentiate immune therapy. So great discussion, uh, great summary of the data. Appreciate both of you being here and appreciate our audience for their uh, attention. Thanks, Brian. Thanks. In our next section, we'll talk about how the latest data for immune-based combinations in kidney cancer can be implemented in clinical practice. So as you're probably aware, there are many immune-based combinations approved uh, both through NCCN guidelines and ESMO guidelines. 
which separate them by IMDC risk factors, but the regimens are fairly consistent across with IOTKIs recommended across risk groups and ipinevo mostly recommended in the intermediate uh, and poor risk groups. There are some other recommended regimens such as single agent TKI or even single agent immune therapy in patients with contraindications. I think the vast majority of guidelines recommend an immune-based doublet as initial therapy for advanced RCC. At ASCO GU 2023, there were a number of uh, abstracts which had relevance to clinical practice, as there are at many of these meetings. They're often um, single institution series that look at patients who've been treated with regimen, so-called real-world outcome, and how it might apply to clinical practice. And we'll talk about um, a few of these studies today. So the first study that we'll talk about actually was a prospective clinical trial done through the uh, Hoosier Cooperative Research Network, or HCRN. Mike Atkins presented these data that have uh, the clinical data have been published in JCO recently, and he presented a treatment-free survival or TFS analysis from this study. As a reminder, this was a study in over 100 patients, frontline kidney cancer, who were treated with nivolumab monotherapy initially. <clears throat> if they had a response at 12 weeks, they continued that monotherapy up to 96 weeks. If they progressed or did not have a response at 48 weeks, then they had salvage ipilimumab added. And again, the clinical data have already been reported. We'll focus today on the treatment-free survival that was reported at ASCO-GU. So um, they looked at a 36-month period, and they looked at treatment-free survival as a percentage of that 36-month period. They broke it down by IMDC risk group, but that was relatively consistent across risk groups and was about 10% of that 36-month period, not quite 10% in the overall population, 9.4%. So about three and a half months, whether patients just got nivolumab and stopped at 96 months or had salvage ipilimumab added. And this is uh, this TFS data has been published with ipinevo. It's being looked at with other regimens, and it's a feature of the regimen. It would be great to have patients you know, alive um, with control disease and with minimal to no toxicity and not require ongoing drugs. I think that's a, a goal, a realistic goal of immune therapy, and TFS is a way to try and characterize and quantify that goal. Um, in their analysis, most of that time, most of that 10% of the 36 months was spent without grade three toxicity, um, which is good. If patients are off therapy, but still have high grade toxicity, then I'm not sure you're, you're helping them. So it was good to see. And, and again, I think these data really add to the whole story of TFS and story of, of being off therapy. Another abstract by you at all looked at patients who got Ipi Nevo in front in frontline therapy, 53 patients who discontinued either electively or due to toxicity and looked at some clinical endpoints. It, it excluded patients, of course, who discontinued for progressive disease. And I think this is really around a theme of can we discontinue Ipi Nevo uh, for toxicity, of course, but even without toxicity, and we'll get to that in the discussion. What they found in this small series, there were nine patients who had a complete response when immune therapy was stopped, and those patients had uh, perfect survival and did not have any progression events. So again, small subset, but certainly a, a complete response to ipinevo tends to be durable even off therapy, I think is the lesson here. Another study looked at what was called intermittent ipinevo. So this was a very small series of nine patients, frontline kidney cancer, intermediate or poor risk, who had um, induction ipinevo up to six months, and then um, I believe up to three months more of maintenance than volumab. And if they achieved a CR or PR, then all therapy was stopped at nine months and they were observed on a regular scan uh, schedule every 12 weeks. There was also a possibility of re-challenge in patients who progressed after that off period. Um, and I think what they showed is that their me median treatment-free interval, so that TFS in those nine patients who responded was 30.6 months. So again, it speaks to patients who respond to this dual immune therapy regimen tends to be durable. They did have two patients uh, relapse uh, and they tried to reinduce, but that did not result in a radiographic response. And there's very little reinduction data in kidney cancer. This might be all of it. Again, only two patients, uh, but did not see any greater, three or four immune related adverse events with that reinduction just wasn't successful. So again, I think this shows that deep and Deep responders to immune therapy can be durable, especially to ipinevo. And then the last abstract will look at something really totally different. That is chromophobe kidney cancer. So chromophobe is a rare subtype of kidney cancer, part of the non-clear cell 
a heterogeneous spectrum of, of diseases. And this was uh, a group that looked at 31 patients with chromophobe who were getting immune-based regimens, either ipinevo or an IOTKI, and just looking at outcome. We don't have a ton of data for immune therapy and kidney cancer. We have some single agent pembrolizumab data, which looks um, like chromophobe is less responsive than the other papillary unclassified, but this is looking at specifically at doublets. And what they saw in comparison to contemporary clear cell treated patients, not surprisingly, is that their time to treatment failure and response rate was much lower than patients with clear cell. Treatment failure in just four and a half months and a response rate of only 12%. So it really reinforces, unfortunately, that this biology, this group of patients is, doesn't appear to be very immune responsive at all and probably needs completely different drugs and, and pathways targeted. So that concludes my overview of, of this section of data that was presented at ASCO GU that could have implications in clinical practice. I'll now introduce my panel for the discussion. First is Dr. Betsy Plumack, a professor of medical oncology and deputy director at Fox Chase Cancer Center in the United States. And Tom Powell, who's a professor at, of GU oncology at Barts Cancer Institute and director of the Barts Cancer Center uh, at, in the UK. So Betsy and Tom, welcome. Appreciate you being here. Let's start with um, what I think is the main theme of this group of abstracts, which is can we stop immune therapy and how do we implement this in practice? And this treatment-free survival is sort of a new concept that I think is, is useful, but, but maybe not well understood. So Betsy, let's start with you. Maybe just talk about when you're giving somebody an immune regimen, pick your favorite, or, or we can talk about different ones. Short of say grade three, four toxicity, are you stopping therapy in anyone? How do you make that decision? How do you follow them? How, do you, yeah, how are you that's using this great- in practice? question. And I was happy to see this sort of constellation of abstracts trying to get at that, because what we really want to be able to tell our patients is it's okay to stop, right? Um, And we don't necessarily have data to rest upon to do that. So all of us have patients in our clinics who are enjoying treatment-free survival. And so that becomes this sort of thing that we strive for, that we hope for, for each of our patients. I typically set up the expectation around treatment that, um, and I use mostly VEGF TKIs and IO therapy, both in trials and that we have ongoing right now and a standard of care. But I set it up that we're going to take stock at a year, see where we are, hope that we've plateaued the response or getting gotten as deep as we're going to get. Um, and then at that point, we'll have a conversation. But at two years, we'd like to stop the immune therapy. We think you'll have had enough at that point. And then the TKI is sort of the wild card, whether we continue that or not in a given patient. Um, I am a little bit suspect of the studies that give you know a short amount of combination therapy and then hold by design. I do like to treat to the deepest response I can get. Again, this is based on data that shows deep responses uh, or near CRs do as well as CRs um, for the most part, at least with Axipembro. So um, that's usually how I set it up. That's usually how I treat. I try not to set too high expectations, but still provide the hope that we might get to a point where we can control the cancer off therapy. So you, you treat not necessarily to a time point per se, but to the deepest PR slash CR you can achieve. Is that that's, fair? That's exactly, I think that's fair. I just like to set expectations up front that, you know, it's not going to be six months or three months. We're done. Yeah. <laughs> we look to a year to sort of get it's going there. going to be a year plus. And it okay. might be shorter. Yeah, yeah. Fair enough. Tom, what do you think? How are you implementing the stopping practice? In practice? I think Betty's point is, is right, that it's important to introduce the concept of this not being treatment forever to the patients early on. Otherwise, my experience is it's very hard to stop these drugs. Um, we talked previously a little bit about contact three, and we talked about showing that sequencing immune checkpoint inhibition doesn't see with all the caveats that we've not seen the data, et cetera, but it doesn't seem to be associated with benefit. And so I think unlike VEGF TKI, where we're quite comfortable to say even second, third, fourth line therapy, sequencing these drugs is probably associated with better disease control, although treatment breaks are attractive. I'm not sure continuous PD, PDL1 therapy is required. Pembro stops at two years. Um, this data here shows us that those patients who stop sooner, albeit in the face of toxicity, appear to do well. And so it's beginning to drive towards that issue to say, actually, we need to be talking about stopping with our patients. Uh, and, and, and therefore I agree it's an important issue. 
the numbers in some of these trials are pretty small at the moment, but I yeah. think as we see more data with sequencing, it's going to become important. So introduce the concept early. I think we all agree by three or six months is too little. I feel more comfortable in that 12 to 18 month. Don't ask me why it's arbitrary, but reasonable. And I feel like, okay. And frankly, people aren't really shrinking and shrinking after 12 to 18 months. I don't find that. Like I find most of my bulk tumor shrinkage is early and maybe a little more. And then by the time you're at that fourth, fifth scan or whatever, you're kind of at the nadir for what it's worth. Mm-hmm. Are you um, stopping then, within a year, Ryan? Are you so, I'm, I'm going till two years. I'm just doing what Pembroke, I'm just with so, Nevo, Nippy Nevo, I stop at two years as well. I'm comfortable with that, but I'm not stopping at one year. I think that's quite brave. Are you guys doing that? So for the IOTKIs, I generally stop the IO at two years unless obviously there's toxicity before then. Ipi Nevo, I think is different, you know, in a, in a good and bad way, right? It's sort of more intense therapy, more toxicity up front, but probably more immune effect. I, I wouldn't stop probably earlier than a year short of some high grade toxicity. But as I'm getting to that 12 to 18 month, I'm starting to have that conversation like, Hey, you're having this really great response. And, you know, we could think about stopping and maybe they have a little joint pain and, you know, they're starting to think, worry about long-term toxicity. So I'm, I'm like Betsy said, I'm starting the conversation at 12 and by 18, I'm probably talking seriously. And, you know, I don't, I don't make somebody stop therapy, but I usually don't have any trouble when I I usually describe some anecdotes of patients who had a lot of trouble on long-term Nevo and they say, okay, doc, whatever you think. (laughs) So I don't have a firm, you know, set in stone practice, but I think it's kind of like Betsy described. I think it's looking at patient tolerance, toxicity. It's looking at their scan. It's looking at that patient anxiety and comfort level. It's kind of, that's the the equation that's going on in my brain when I'm making these decisions. And Brian, Betsy, some people say to me, um, that the Ipi Nevo results, the reason why the long-term data is so good, and I'm not sure the long-term data is better than the other trials. I just think the other trials haven't got there yet. But some people say that's because in the Nevo trial, we kept going for ne- with Nevo forever, and Pembro was stopped at two years. And that's obviously the opposite argument of what you, you were saying today. Yeah, so yeah. I'll take a different approach. I think the Ipi Nevo data looks better because people were supposed to be on Nevo forever. And when they stopped it, we stopped filling out CRFs and documenting response or progression as aggressively and consistently as in the comparator trials where they're meant to stop. And so the study is designed with that in mind and designed to follow people who have stopped more closely. So that that would be my my argument. I think not everyone uh, stayed on therapy long-term, but the converse of that is I think once you're at year two and a half, three, four of checkpoint inhibitor therapy, I do get a sense that it's just sort of a waste of time and money that we're not really getting more bang for our buck. And that's informed by the Pembro studies, which all cease across the board at two years um, and don't see detriment. So um, two different ways to look at that. Yeah. Our last topic is around chromophobe. We know from Kino 427 single agent Pembro appeared that chromophobe was less responsive than Papillary and unclassified. The data presented at ASCO GU, again, a retrospective series, it appears that it's less responsive to immune based combinations, perhaps not surprising, and there are other series. Tom, I'll start with you. How do you treat frontline chromophobe patient walks in, no contraindication, needs treatment? What are you, what are you giving them? So, patients with chromophobe cancer with advanced disease, um, you know, it, it's, it's a, a tricky situation because there's not much data. And, you know, with a, we, the, the European guidelines group got together recently, you know, we're, we're giving them VEGF targeted therapy, single agent, Brian, um, with modest results. And, um, and I think it's an area which is, it's a rare cancer. It's hard to do studies on these patients. And I think it's terrific that we're getting some data in these groups. Um, so, uh, yeah, we're just giving VEGF targeted therapy. Yeah. Yeah. Probably very unsatisfyingly. So I imagine, but I don't disagree. Betsy, what do you, what do you think? Yeah, I agree. I usually start with something like cabozantinib. I think that data and chromophobes show they're very, very slow to grow and very slow to respond. So it's sort of like everything's happening in slow motion. And I try to get away with single agent therapy initially because they might be on it for a really long time with kind of stable disease. I do a lot of observation in chromophobe patients. I usually try to start with that to get a sense yeah. of the pace. And then um, there was a, a poster, I think it's published now. Tom Hudson looked at lenvatinib everolimus in non-clear cell and uh, some of the chromophobe had nice responses and I've experienced that in clinical practice as well. I usually don't give it frontline though. 
Yeah, I think it was it was four of nine patients. It's the most famous nine patient series in history. <laughs> but as you say, a lot of us in clinical practice have seen responses. So, you know, I still tend to give an immune based therapy because I think it's the only thing that cures people, even if they're much less responsive. Um, but I think I've heard a lot of people say they give Lena first. I, we don't know, right? I mean, we're I, th- I think pick your favorite. They're all unsatisfying and, and hope you have a trial for them, which is probably the right answer. So, right. Do, do either of you sequence chromophobe or look for PDL1? Not, I don't look at PDL1. I think doing, you know, whole exome sequencing is perfectly reasonable. I can't say I've had much clinical luck or impact with it, but I think it's perfectly reasonable in non clear cell in general, frankly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Tom, did you have something to add? No, I, we, we're not sequencing chromophobe. Yeah. Well, it's been a, a good discussion. Again, I think both of these, this panel has been particularly, you know, sort of clinically impactful because we're all, we all struggle with the, some of these questions and deal with it on a, on a daily basis. So thanks to both of you for an interesting discussion and thanks to our audience for your participation. Thank you both. Yeah. Thanks, Brian.